Do you follow homesteading accounts or read homesteading blogs, maybe pin on Pinterest and just wish that you could have that connected to nature, simpler seeming life? I know I do, as I've been on my journey to taking my garden to a homestead. And really, when I think about it for gardeners, a homestead is a natural next step because we grow all of our food and then we look to preserve it and save our precious garden harvests to last us through the year. We look to compost to feed our soil. You're probably doing some aspects of homesteading already and not even knowing it. I'm so thrilled to welcome my longtime plant friend, Kevin Espiritu of Epic Gardening, back to the podcast for a talk today about his epic, see what I did there, homesteading journey over the last few years. If you followed Kevin on his massive social media channels at Epic Gardening, you know that he's had a pretty amazing garden in San Diego for many years and recently bought property in San Diego, kind of in the suburbs, and has turned it into a high-tech homestead that is drool-worthy and aspirational for sure. He has basically dedicated the last couple of years to learning all about how to create the best homestead on minimal square footage. And we'll be walking us through the basics today for anyone who is green with envy about his setup like I am. Welcome to the Growing Joy with Plants podcast, where we not only learn how to care for plants successfully, but how to simply and affordably use our plant babies to cultivate more joy in our lives by doing so. I'm Maria, former plant killer turned happy plant lady, author of Growing Joy, The Plant Lover's Guide to Cultivating Happiness, speaker, podcaster, and most importantly, your new best plant friend. On Growing Joy with Plants, you'll find conversations about houseplant care, gardening tutorials, and wellness through the lens of plants. Plant care. Hello, plant friends. If you're a new listener, welcome to the Growing Joy with Plants podcast. I'm Maria, your new best plant friend, and I'm here to help you care for plants and cultivate joy. If you're a recurring listener, welcome back. I'm so honored to be part of your journey here that we get to grow joy together. Today's episode on homesteading is so good. Kevin is so knowledgeable. Before we dive into our talk, I just wanted to let you know, if you are someone who likes visual learning in addition to audio learning, We have relaunched our YouTube channel with high quality professional YouTube tutorials that are either complementary to the podcasts or completely separate to the podcasts. So if you like YouTube, I highly suggest you going over and subscribing to my YouTube channel, Growing Joy with Maria. We recently released a terrarium how-to video. We've got a houseplant repotting tutorial and demo, Kokodama workshops, so many fun things. It's been a blast. So go check it out if you like it. And if not, just remember to stay subscribed to this podcast because we're bringing you free episodes on a weekly basis. I hope you know who Kevin is of Epic Gardening. He's probably one of the largest gardening influencers around. He's coming out with his third book, Epic Homesteading. And he has gifted us with an hour of his time chatting all about the different aspects of homesteading. So we walk through all of the different elements of homesteading, and then how you can apply it to your home, whether you've got a small space or acres and acres to work with. So without further ado, let's dive in. Here's Kevin. Kevin, welcome back to Growing Joy. The last time you were on the show, we were still Bloom and Grow Radio. I feel like it was 100 years ago. Yeah, yeah, no, it was quite some time ago. I'm glad to be back. Yeah, so glad to have you. So How long have you been in your new Epic Homestead for? It's been, let me see, it's January 24 now. So it would have been September 2020. So probably like three and a half years or so. Insane. The pandemic must have been so insane for you with, you know, hosting Epic Gardening, but also moving into your homestead building. I mean, I feel like you took on so, just following you on social media, you took on so many projects all at once. Like what is, what does this upgrade look like for you? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's crazy to think of all the things that happened over the last, you know, two, three years. Uh, but now the homestead's actually pretty well built out. It was like an empty lot when I got there. And so now, you know, there's a pond, there's a chicken coop, there's a greenhouse, there's gardens in the front and the back, there's an orchard, all sorts of different systems now. So I wouldn't say you're done because you're never really done, but it's coming along really nicely. Yeah. I guess the last time we had talked, you still had your original plot which was a rental, you had really dug into the gardening with your raised beds. Why were you so attracted to the homestead lifestyle? What made you want to buy the property, 
put all of this stuff in, get your your chicken daddy or a flower daddy, you know, you've got all these cool things. What was the inspiration for homesteading for you? I think it was just the curiosity to see how much further I could take the growing. And so, you know, in the rental, not a lot of space and just not a lot of ability to expand. And so with the new space, sort of new possibilities, right? Like I couldn't even have an orchard before. And now that I have one, you start thinking, oh, well, of course I have fresh fruit, but what could I do with that fruit in the off season or how can I preserve it? And then once you get into the preserving, you go, okay, what, what else can I preserve? And then the rabbit hole gets deeper and deeper, right? And so eventually you start to get into pretty much every aspect of being more self-sufficient that you can. Can you talk about, because I think for a lot of people, homesteading feels so intimidating and so inaccessible. I know you're on less than half an acre, like you're making it accessible. You know, you don't need to have a million acres the way I do to do homesteading. Can you talk about like what incremental steps, what did you add after you started your garden? Like, what did that look like? And you can even go back to your original property where Epic Garden started and kind of bring us through that jump. Yeah. So, I mean, the first property at the rental was just container gardening, balcony Mm -hmm. gardening type thing. And then some small raised beds in the front yard. So let's just get a garden going, however you want to do that. If you're in a small place, I I was in an even smaller place before that. And that was just true balcony planters. And that's about it type of growing. And then as I moved into the the homestead property where I'm at now, it was an in-ground garden actually in the front yard and a grow bag or container style garden in the backyard. I just set some quick irrigation up, like looked very sloppy, but it, it got you growing. And then, you know, as... I expanded on the system to put a shed in and then all my tools could get there. And then once I had the tools, I could do more work in the garden. I think the first sort of big system I ended up putting in was, it's a pretty old house. I bought it from this company that like flips homes. And so the way they flipped it wasn't great. And so I had to replace the roof to do the solar. I think I probably would have had to do that regardless, but solar was the first kind of big system that I put on because here in San Diego, Sunlight's abundant, but energy prices are actually quite high. And so it was like the perfect type of maybe not self-sufficiency, but like reduction of my need of grid energy that I put on. So that was like the big first move. Yeah. So you were gardening first and then was composting what was next before the solar? I basically had just a pile, like a true literal pile, nothing to contain it or anything like that in the backyard and just a heap, right? And it it was more of a cold compost. I would say if it got built up to a certain level, it probably would have gone hot every so often. But for the most part, it was just like a cold decomposition pile. And that's as easy as it has to be at the start. You don't have to build a fancy, you know, three bin system or get a tumbler or anything like that. Yeah, it's so cool. So what is the difference in your opinion of homesteading and gardening? For those who are listening to this episode, because they they hear homesteading a lot, it's getting thrown around a lot. But what is your definition of that, of the difference? I would say that it's almost an intentional difference. If you want to provide some amount for yourself, so become self-sufficient in some capacity, to me, you've kind of made the mental shift. And that might not, I guess, fully express until you have the space to do it in a more meaningful way. But to be honest, if you're growing all your leafy greens, all your herbs, and perhaps like recycling a lot of your waste, like that's a homesteader's mindset at the very least. Yeah, even just the people who are composting, just using their cities, like if you're living in an urban environment, but you're using your city's compost system, like that is the intentionality. And then it's just like, what are you working with? And what how can you push it to the next step? Right? Yeah, I think that's kind of what it is, is whatever you're gated by based on your space or your budget or your lifestyle, just get to that level, and you build a comfort there. And then once things change, you can improve. Yeah. So the different aspects of homesteading so far that we've gone through, there's obviously gardening, which hopefully most people listening to are already doing. Then you've got the composting. You mentioned solar. I know that you're very into your chickens. Yeah. There's chickens. And then what else? I mean, I guess there's water. What are other elements of homesteading that we should be thinking about in terms of the potential, like everything available to us? Yeah. I mean, you can take it so far, right? I mean, there's, I get obsessed sometimes watching YouTube videos of people who are all the way off grid in a rural area, maybe even on generator power or something like that. They really aren't relying on anything whatsoever, just fully self-sufficient. And 
at that point, you need to have every system available to you. You need to have water. You need to have some sort of way to get rid of waste. You need to have compost. Ideally, you're growing at a pretty large scale, and then you have to figure out how to process and preserve and store that stuff because a lot of the folks that are doing that are doing that over, let's say, a winter, more wintry climate. And so maybe they'll build out a root cellar or they'll build out a preserving area. And so you can get so far, but at least for me, the systems I've sort of been experimenting with, like you mentioned, chickens for sure, I think is almost a must have if you get into this lifestyle. You could go ducks, you could go quails, a lot of different animals, but some sort of organism that's processing waste and ideally hopefully giving you something in return. Water for me is big because we're abundant in sun, but we're maybe not so abundant in water here in, in Southern California. And so for me, it means capture water. So capture rainwater off of the roof and store that and then use that. And then also reuse water at least twice if I can. So there's some systems, obviously, you would not want to do that, like toilet water, you wouldn't want to do. But uh, shower water, if you change some of the products that you use, you can do it with laundry water is actually a really good use case for uh, what's called a gray water system. Gray meaning water has been used once. Yeah. So gray water, I feel like people, I mean, especially if you're living in the West in California, water is such a kind of rare commodity. So can you talk about gray water and then all of the different ways that you might be able to recycle water available to you? Sure. Yeah. So you have three sort of types of water. You have water, which is just straight out of the city tap. And then you've got gray water, which means it's been put through some sort of process. Like if you've showered with it, if you've washed your laundry with it, et cetera, Uh, maybe run it through the kitchen sink, but actually both kitchen sink water and toilet water is what's considered black water, which means you really don't want to reuse that in the garden unless, I mean, honestly, you probably really shouldn't at all, but there are ways to do it, but that kind of gets a little bit deep into a rabbit hole. So those are the three categories. Gray water is is basically a way to double the use case of that water, right? Because if you think about when you shower, you're not using the water in the sense of it's being consumed. It's it's running into a drain and then going somewhere else, typically to the city. And you're using all sorts of products, so maybe you wouldn't want that in your soil. But for me, I, I have Dr. Bronner's soap, which is a Castile soap. So yes. It's like a pure soap. We love that soap too. Yeah, it's great. And then what I'll do is I'll just, I only use that. And then the water goes out and it pipes out instead of to the sewer, it goes out to my orchard, my citrus orchard. Uh, And it just kind of drops into this trench that's filled with mulch and that helps wick the water into the soil. And there you go. I mean, the trees don't really mind that there's a little bit of soap because it breaks down with some of the natural life in the soil. So there's no purification. It's just coming right out of your shower drain into your citrus orchard. Yeah, goes straight in and has to go straight in. You can't and don't want to really store gray water. You want it to be used immediately. So when you you think about like a laundry and why laundry is so good is because your laundry machine has a built-in pump to get the water out of the laundry machine. That's how that works. It'll pump it into the pipe and that goes into the sewer. So the way that you do it with a laundry gray water is you install a three-way valve and you have a little knob and you can turn it so that it can go to the sewer. Or when you turn it, it'll shunt the water to your system, which will dump it out to wherever you want it to go. But the idea is it, it does have to get used right away. So in my case, it pumps out to a little area in my front yard that goes to a patch that I've dug out for artichokes. And artichokes being great because it's a perennial plant. It keeps growing year after year. And once they're established, they don't need a ton of water. So the couple times a week we'll do the laundry, that, that's completely fine. That's all it really needs. And I don't have to worry about watering that ever again. That's so cool. And even with the laundry, you're not purifying that at all. It's Are you using Dr. Bronner's or some sort of really all natural detergent there too? Yeah, yeah. So you, you have to use a biodegradable soap. There's one I use called Oasis. That's a really okay. good one. And then if you want to, you can also put on a microplastics filter onto the water before it leaves into the gray water system. So you've captured because you know, there's like little lints and all that sort of stuff that might be might make it through unless you filter that out. So you can do that if you want to. That's so cool. So that's gray water. And then talk to me about rainwater, because I feel like there's, especially in California, but there's all sorts of, you can put a bucket under your gutters, or you can get really fancy with it. So how are you using your rainwater? And also, what are the different ways that people might want to start collecting their rainwater for their gardens? 
Yeah, I actually started pretty much the way you described. It was a bigger bucket. It was like a trash can or I think an IBC tote, which are those sort of standardized totes that people will use for all sorts of different purposes. And I basically just used the natural gutter that was cut into my roof and angled it so that it fell in at the right angle. That's the way that I started out. And then I had to rig up all these hose systems to try to get that water out into the actual garden. So in my particular case, my house did not have gutters on it when I bought it. And so I actually had to install gutters to even have the ability to capture water. Most houses, I think, have gutters. Imagine that beautiful harmony wafting its way through your home while you sit inside bundled up and warm. It reminds me of the Danish term hygge, spelled H-Y-G-G-E, which is all about creating a warm atmosphere and enjoying the good things in life with good people while being cozy. Whenever I hear my wind river wind chimes waft throughout my home, especially in the winter while I'm bundled up inside, it immediately sets me at ease and reminds me to take a mindful moment with a deep breath. So for today's ad, Wind River Chimes is gifting you a moment of coziness to drop in, take a deep breath, and feel all the warm and cozies. This winter, treat yourself or someone you love to the mindfulness and coziness that comes along with these magical Wind River wind chimes and personalize it. You can use the code GROWINGJOY at windriverchimes.com to get a free engraving to any engravable wind chime to add a special element to your gift. They come in a variety of colors, sizes, and sounds, so head to windriverchimes.com to listen and learn, and don't forget to use code GROWINGJOY at checkout to receive a free engraving. On an episode about homesteading, it makes sense to also talk about preparing your garden and life for potential climate change. There's a lot to be worried about when it comes to climate change, whether it's water usage restrictions, extended heat waves, disastrous flooding, super weeds that take over your garden, or prolonged pest life cycles. There's daunting challenges ahead for food growers around the world. What's a gardener to do, right? Well, in this new book, The Climate Change Resilient Vegetable Garden, author Kim Stoddard outlines a clear path towards building resilience in your vegetable plants, your soil, and yourself. It is an amazing book. It gives you so much clarity. It not only defines what's happening with the climate crisis, but how it's applying to our gardens and how to prepare for it. With actionable tasks that reduce resource use, stabilize the garden ecosystem, and offer regenerative solutions to the most challenging issues faced by gardeners, Kim comes to the rescue with advice to help you to weather these storms with ease. The Climate Change Resilient Vegetable Garden is going to be your how-to guide for avoiding climate-related disasters in your garden, where you'll learn to select the most adaptable fruits and vegetable crops, nurture biologically active soils, discover intensive planting techniques, recycle rainwater, enhance biodiversity, and much more. This book is honestly the perfect accompaniment to this episode. Even longtime vegetable gardeners will face unexpected challenges in the years to come. So build resilience now by grabbing the Climate Change Resilient Vegetable Garden by author Kim Stoddart. You can pick it up at your favorite local bookstore, bookshop.org, Barnes & Noble, or Amazon.com. That's the Climate Change Resilient Vegetable Garden by author Kim Stoddart. So that was step one. And then after that, it was designing how big the system needs to be because you have the sort of general rules of thumb, like an inch of water, an inch of rain on, I think, a thousand square foot roof is 600 gallons or something like that. I forgot the exact calculation, wow. but yeah. you have to know like, okay, well, how much water am I going to get over a year, which you could look at your annual rainfall patterns? How much would I want to capture? Can I afford to purchase that system? Or can I place something that large in my house? In my case, it was a 5,000 gallon cistern was my main capture system which is pretty big when you think about what that actually looks like. And then you have to figure out how to get the water to it. So in my case, rain comes down, hits the roof, goes into a gutter, goes through a system that processes it a little bit. Basically, there's like a leaf filter at the top to catch the large debris. And then there's what's called a first flush filter. So the first like 20 gallons of water will be shunted into a different area. And you can drain that off because that's like the dirt that's on your roof and it carries all the initial mess. After that, 
it starts pushing it into the main system, which will, it actually goes underground in my case. It's like a pipe that goes underground and then just drops into my cistern, which is across the property. So I, I kind of have this system where rain hits the roof and magically appears in, in this big barrel on the other side of the property, but it's all gravity fed. Right. And then how is the water coming out of that cistern? I'm assuming you have irrigation lines hooked up to it. Yeah, well, you can do it a couple ways. Like if you have the spigot will always be at the bottom. And so gravity will also force that water out when you turn that spigot, you can connect it to a hose if you want. But if you need more pressure, you can use uh, what's called a pressure sensitive pump. And so when it's plugged in, and it detects water coming in, from the cistern side, it'll actually trigger on and turn on. And basically you get as much pressure as you would if you were using just a normal hose out of the city. And so you can turn it into basically no difference, I guess, than, than a standard hose. Or you could plug it into your wow. if you wanted as well. That's wild. And is there an in-between option between putting the bucket under your gutter and then having the cistern underground? Yeah. So the, the in-between is actually something I do have on the property because I have there's a section of my roof that's not connected to the other roof. And so it needs its own capture. And then my shed also has its own capture because it's a pretty sizable, like slanted roof. And it's separate from my main roof. And so what you do there is it's basically the same thing. It's a gutter into some sort of filter system. But in this case, you'd go into just a rain barrel. So it's a specific barrel designed to capture rain and accept it from the top. Most of the time you can get some kind of rebate from the city. It depends on the state. And of course, the city, but most of the time there is one, at least in California, I know that there's quite a few. And you can go 50 gallons, 100 gallons, 500 gallons if you want to. When you get into like above 500 gallons, you're getting into what's called a cistern, which is just a much bigger kind of system. But yeah, you can totally do that. And then the way to get the water out is much the same, connected to a hose, or you could even just fill a, a water watering can and then hand water whatever you want. But it's really nice. I mean, it's you get nice, fresh, clean water and, and you can use it right away. Yeah, that's amazing. So at this point, how off the grid are you? Are you fully, I mean, off grid even in San Diego? How much of the water that you're saving are you actually using? How much energy are, you know, from the grid are you still using? I'm curious. As far as energy goes, the way it works, which I actually didn't know until I got solar, was when you have solar, it feels like when you have it, the sun hits the solar panels, that makes energy, and then you just use that energy and you're good, right? It doesn't really work that way. The way it works is the sun hits the solar panels, that generates electricity. That electricity just goes into the grid, goes backwards, right? And so at least here in California, you pay whatever you net it out. So let's say I generated 1,000 kilowatt hours. I made that, but I used 750 that month. So on the net, I gave the grid 250. So what'll happen is the energy company, at least mine, will say, okay, you don't owe anything to us because you actually gave us more than, than you used, but we're not going to pay you for the 250. We'll give you a credit for whatever that price would be, 250 times whatever the price of the energy is. And you can use that as like a bank. And so, you know, in the warm months in summer, I'm not using as much electricity, but I'm generating a lot. And so I'll watch my balance on my energy company's website go negative, right? So I'll be like negative $800 or negative $1,000. And then as you get towards the winter, you'll notice you, your, your energy goes up, but the days are shorter and the sun is lower. So you're generating less energy. So typically you end up consuming more than you produce, even if you have solar in the winter. And then you started drawing up that balance back to neutral, right? And then in my case, in my jurisdiction, because every energy company is different, I net out at the end of the year. So you'll pay, I pay once a year, whatever I ended up being different. So in my case, because we do use quite a bit of energy here with the pond and with all the different systems and the people that work here, I think I paid about 350 or $400 for an entire year's worth of electricity. Oh my God, that's wild. <laughs> that's so wild. Wow. And so then the way you do the math is like, whatever that would have been, because you know how much energy you used and you know how much it would have cost, you take that number and divide that into the price you paid for the solar. And that gives you basically how many years at that usage rate you'd have to exist for that solar to actually break even. You know what I mean? Wow, that's so cool. Do you have a battery? 
are can you also get the solar panels and then have the energy go into a battery so that you can save it for like a power outage? Yeah, so that's the next step would be Okay. If you get a battery, you can do some really crazy stuff. The, the reason I didn't get one is because at the time I put the solar in, it was just very expensive. And yeah. I would have to get probably two to get about two days worth of energy based on my usage. And so it just didn't seem worth it at the time. But you're totally right. Like that is actually the only way to get off the grid in a suburban setting, like uh, in, an, in a regular city. There's no other way because what you'll do in that case, is really kind of clever because the way that power is built, it depends on the time of use. So if everyone's running their dishwashers and cooking and watching TV at like 6 to 9 p.m., that's called your on-peak hours. That's when most people are, are using it. So energy is more expensive at that time. But if you were chilling around at 3 a.m. playing video games or something, your energy usage is going to be pretty low. Everyone else is sleeping. And so what you can do with the battery is called rate arbitrage. It's pretty cool. So what you can do is when you generate the energy from your solar, store it in your battery. When the energy is most expensive, you set it up so that your home is running off of battery power. Mm, and when the energy okay. is not expensive, you're using it from the grid and you're refilling your battery during that time. And so basically you can set it up so that you never have to pay the highest rates for energy that everyone else does. You know, when you're running your dishwasher at 6 p.m., that's off your battery and everyone else is pulling it from the grid and paying that premium. So if you do go that route, it can get really efficient, but again, you still have to pay for the battery. So it becomes a financial equation, but sometimes it's not about the finances. Sometimes it's just about, I want to feel secure and that in an emergency, I'd be okay. Yeah, but this is where homesteading does speak to urban or suburban living, where you're just saving so much money on your power bill. Do you live in the suburbs or do you live in the city still? Uh, San Diego is kind of weird because it's so spread out. Yeah, San Diego is really spread out, but I'm I'm not really in the city at all. It's not pure suburban, I would say, but it's not urban really either. So it, suburban is probably the best way to describe it. Yeah, like even if you're not gardening, that's just a really cool idea to be doing solar. We were talking about water before and you mentioned your pond. Why did you put a pond in? Where does the pond play into homesteading? Well, the pond kind of came as a surprise because I'd followed these guys from Aquascapes. They're like the number one sort of pond installers out there for quite some time. And we developed a relationship and we decided to collaborate together and do a pond. I'd always wanted one, but I just didn't, you know, it wasn't high, high up on the list of priorities. But now that I have it, it's actually really, it's really clever the way that that pond works, at least the way that they design ponds. Because you think about a pond, you think, well, dig a hole, put water in it, plant stuff around it, you have a pond. Uh, but in their case, they do it to the next level, like it's on a different level. So what they'll do is they'll dig a reservoir next to where the pond will be. In my case, it was about, I don't know, 2000 gallon reservoir. They'll fill that up with these blocks. They're called aqua blocks. It's like a very lightweight, but strong sort of rectangular frame. And you can stack a bunch of them together. So that basically fills the space, but it doesn't really fill it because it's so lightweight. And it's like a very sort of flexible frame but you can put something on top of that and it, it stays very stable. So basically what they'll create is like a floating patio and you can fill the bottom of that with water, but you can still walk on it and stand on it and enjoy your, your time. And then they'll put a pump at the bottom of that. And what they'll do from there is then they dig the pond out next to it. And so the pond will have this like natural cascading waterfall and then it'll return back into that patio system. So it looks very natural. It looks very real. And what I really liked about that is you're creating what's called a microclimate. So you're changing the environment, the topography, you're changing the humidity around the pond. Obviously, there's more moisture there. And so the types of things you can grow, the types of things you can plant, the types of wildlife that might come around, it's very different. And so we've noticed, you know, in the springtime, tons and tons of birds are bathing in that pond. I'll even see like little rodents and mammals come through like raccoons or whatever, which sometimes is annoying, but it's still kind of cool. Yeah, for your garden. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And then we'll be able to grow aquatic edibles or aquatic plants that we couldn't grow otherwise. So I've made watercress soup from the pond because watercress, of course, loves to grow in water. And I've been able to grow wasabi, which really wants like a cold running stream. So where are you going to get that? Pond? So for me, it ends up being a really neat way to kind of experience a different type of landscape, I guess. But then if you think about it, the pond is also a 2000 gallon reservoir and a 1500 gallon pond, which I know is extreme. So you can start way smaller than that. But that's more water. If you think about it, that's capturing even more water. 
And when it rains, it refills that pond. And so I'm storing more sort of resources on the property. Yeah, you could use that pond water to water your plants if you needed to. I don't know if you want to shower in it, but... It would actually be really good water because I have some koi fish in there, like four or five koi. And I have, I don't know, some like little mosquito fish or something. But if you think about the watercress grows really well in that, why? There's water, obviously, it needs that. But where's the nutrient coming from? It's mostly from the fish waste. And so I've created effectively an aquaponic system. So growing plants and fish together. And so if you think about watering with that water, you're watering with an inherently more sort of biologically active and lightly fertilized water than you would if you were just watering from the city, which actually would have like chlorine or, or something like that. In it. So you, you tend to find that the pond water, if you were to water with it, the plants respond a lot better, like they'll green up and they'll look really good. Do you have salamanders? I know I want one. I want one. I really do. I want to add like a frog or a salamander or something like that. But I was told that they would kind of run away. And so I don't want to get them and just like have them die or something. So so we have a nine foot pond on our property. We rent, but my landlord's kids released salamanders into it many years ago. This pond is like a freaking salamander sanctuary. There's oh, wow. so many salamanders there to the point that I'm like scared to go swimming because I'm scared they're going to go in my bathing suit. But I guess they're fun to watch. And the frogs are beautiful too, because then you get the sound. I was going to say, I mean, one of my favorite aspects of our pond and stream is just the the running water sound is so restorative. And I guess yeah. you have running water sound as well, right? The running water is probably the best part about it, especially in summer, you go out, lay out there, hang out, get a little tan going, have a drink or something. And then you listen to that. And great to read a book, great to have coffee in the morning. Yeah, I mean, the peacefulness it brings, I think has been huge. That's so beautiful. I love that. When we're talking about homesteading, it's important to talk about what you decide to grow your food in, right? That's one of the main components of gardening and growing amazing vegetables to eat for you and your family. I personally love Espoma Organic, and I've been growing all of my food and flowers in their soils and composts for years. If you don't already know about them, Espoma Organic is a 90-year-old family-owned and operated company dedicated to making safe indoor and outdoor gardening products for people, pets, and the planet. They have what you need to go throughout your entire garden season. So as we prep for the gardening season, Espoma has high quality options for your indoor and outdoor plant collections. You can start seeds in their seed starting mix. You can then plant up your seedlings in the garden with their Biotone Starter Plus plant food that helps your plants grow larger root mass to help them establish faster and reduces transplant loss. And then you can use their large array of garden soils, compost, and potting mixes for whatever container or bed you're gardening in. If you're gardening in ground, if you're gardening in raised beds, if you're gardening in grow bags or containers, they have specific soils for all of those different growing methods. I love their land and sea compost. And then you can continue to feed your plants throughout the gardening season with their line of fertilizers called Tones. So they have garden tone, flower tone, bulb tone, tomato tone, citrus tone, whatever you're growing, they've got a tone for it. And if you're a houseplant parent, keep it simple with their general potting mix and their liquid indoor houseplant food for all your green indoor babies. To top it all off, Espoma has a huge sustainability commitment with 100% solar powered plant, zero waste manufacturing and eco-friendly packaging. To learn more about their indoor and outdoor products, visit espoma.com to see where your local Espoma dealers are or click the link in the show notes to go to my Amazon storefront where I have a curated list of my Espoma favorites. Thanks, Espoma. Okay, we got to talk about your chickens. Tell me about your chicken journey. Chickens are my next frontier. I dream about them. I look at coops online all the time. So when did you get the chickens? Tell me about the approach and then all the different ways that the chickens are giving back to your homestead. Sure. So I got the chickens. Oh man, I think the first batch that I raised, I raised them all from baby chicks, not from eggs. Oh, so you got a little incubator and stuff? No, so I didn't raise them from eggs. And so oh, okay. I didn't hatch them, but I did get them as like day old chicks. And so effectively, yeah, I had like a little brooding setup. But yeah, it was about two years ago for the first batch. And then I raised another one, I don't know, a year, half a year ago, maybe. And so I have nine now, I've lost one. So I was supposed to have 10. But it's been really cool. I mean, having them around, obviously, you get eggs, even though right now they're a little bit, they're a little bit lazy. They're not making that many because it's winter. I have nine eggs, nine hens, I get like maybe one or two eggs a day right now, which isn't isn't great. 
as you get into summer. That's enough for breakfast. Yeah, I mean, it's a breakfast and, and half of the hens aren't laying yet because they're not old enough. But either way, you get eggs, right? I mean, and you get eggs that you know the hens were happy, were treated well, were eating a, a solid diet. We'll let them forage. We'll give them scraps from the garden. But we also, of course, give them their normal chicken feed and some chicken treats. And so you know that the eggs are really quality and they're just really good tasting. So there you go. You have your protein and fat coming out of that. Then you get to recycle some of the garden scraps with them, which they then, of course, convert to eggs and droppings. And then you get the chicken droppings, right? You get the, the fertilizer benefits of them. So when you clean out your hen house, you'll have your bedding material, which is maybe like a wood shaving or something like that. And mixed in with that is chicken droppings, which are really high in nitrogen and considered sort of a hot fertilizer. Like if you were to use it right away, your plants probably wouldn't like it all that much. And so what's really nice is when you clean the bedding out, if you have a composting system, you can put the bedding right into the composting system. It tends to heat a compost pile up really well. And then once that breaks down, you can apply that directly to the garden, which of course grows the produce that you're feeding the scraps to the chickens of. And you, you can start to see how the cycle plays in. That's so cool. And have you gotten attached to them? Like, are you interacting with them throughout the day or is it more pretty clean? I think especially early when you're raising them from the baby stage, you definitely do. And then as they grow up, because they're not as friendly, they're not as like, hey, I want to be held, you know, they're still friendly. They're still cool. But I, I do treat them, I wouldn't say like all the way as like a farm animal type, like they all have names, you know, they all have different personalities. I can tell, you know, how they're feeling, et cetera. But um, yeah, no, it's, it's just really nice to have them around. And then the fall, winter, we'll often let them roam around the garden and come out of their coop and their run. And that's really nice because they'll start to clean up a lot of the dead plant matter on their own, like little organic robots, you know, running around, or they'll, they'll eat a lot of pests, which is really great. So you can run them through an area of the garden where you have a pest problem, and they'll come in and just munch everything. And you have to pay a price because they'll also munch a few of your plants. But better than you having to go do that job. I'm assuming you have the highest tech, smartest coop around. What are your homesteading tips for your chicken keeping tips for people interested in in getting into having chickens, but also like having it be easy? I've seen it go a lot of different ways. I did, you're right, I did go with a bit of an epic coop. So it's a company called Carolina Coops and I got their Carolina model. So it's like, way overboard for what you actually need to start with chickens. Jacques on our team, who was my first garden assistant and now has his own YouTube channel. And Oh, he does? Yeah, he has his own channel. He has his own Instagram, TikTok channels, and he's kind of sharing his approach to gardening. He did a full DIY coop for, I think, less than $500. Just took him a while to build it out. Fully custom, makes complete sense, perfect for his hens. He built a very lightweight, inexpensive outdoor run planted some trees in there, planted some forage. So he was in and out for really not that much money at all. And so you don't need to go crazy to get a coop, but you know, it's called Epic Homesteading. So I'm going to take it to a little bit of an extreme just to show what's possible, I guess. Absolutely. Tell me what's possible. So does it electronically open and close so you don't have to let them in and out every day? Yeah. I mean, honestly, that's really in my opinion, that's almost a mandatory feature on a coop because if you're living, especially this style of life where it's more suburban life, a lot of folks that are doing this, they don't just do this for a living. They, they have careers and jobs that they do and then go to work and go do those jobs. And so it's tough to rely on your memory to go let the chickens in and out every single day. So there's a automatic chicken door that I really like. You can you can do it based on time. You can do it based on sunlight. It'll trigger based on the photo period of, of the day. And it'll let the chickens in and out automatically, which is a really, really great feature. And that's actually not that expensive. It's called, I believe it's called the chicken guard and we have it on our store, but it's, it's really nice. The coop itself is fancy mostly because it's a custom wooden designed coop and it's quite large. So mine is six feet by 18 feet. And the hen house is kind of raised up above the ground and it's got all these little roosting bar add-ons and a little weather vane on top and all the kind of decor stuff that, that makes it look really cool. Yeah, so cute. I love it. Oh, you are my chicken dreams. That's what I want for our next house too. I was interested in your book that you had a whole chapter on indoor gardening when I feel like home, so much of homesteading is about outdoor gardening. Do you recommend indoor gardening almost because the climate is so volatile and in the future, outdoor gardening might be harder? Or 
was the intent of that chapter to have an offering for people who don't have their own outdoor space? Yeah, it's mostly the latter. It's mostly, hey, sometimes you just can't, you just can't make it work outdoors, right? Or if, if you're an aspiring, let's call it an aspiring homesteader, you know, what can you do indoors? Well, you can grow tons of microgreens, tons of herbs and leafy greens, which at least from a nutritional perspective, provide a lot of of benefit. You might not be able to grow like a year's supply of potatoes inside, but you got to get started somehow. And even if you use a hydroponic system indoors, you can create quite a bit of value out of that. If you think about herbs and leafy greens, if you eat a lot of those, it's expensive at the store, especially if you go to like a farmer's market and try to support local, that's also quite expensive, more so. And so if you grow a little bit indoors, it's kind of like we talked about at the beginning of the episode, setting you up for success in the future, whatever your, your home cycle goal might be. Yeah, we have a hydroponic, a lettuce grow model. I think in your book, you have like the rise model, the rise garden, but I think it's a garden that's in our Oh, garden with the Y, right, right, right. There's tons of companies that do these cool, sleek things that you can put in your house. But um, yeah, and even throughout the different seasons, we'll grow different things. But in the winter, I'm always growing herbs and some edible flowers, because the herbs get so expensive at the store. It just makes so much more sense to have herbs on hand. And then the edible flowers just for the joy factor when we're buried in snow as we are right now. <laughs> so, oh, I wanted to ask you about your orchard. What inspired the orchard? I know you've loved the dragon fruit for a while. And oh, didn't you give our mutual friend Pat Flynn, didn't you give him dragon fruit cuttings too? Didn't you get him turned on to dragon fruit? Oh, yeah. Yeah. But um, what inspired the orchard? Was it the dragon fruit or what was the progression of that? Because you have quite a robust orchard in your setup now. Yeah, I mean, I think I always wanted to grow more trees, but I just never had the space. I, I had a small loquat tree in my old property. When I when I saw this place before I bought it, there was a big loquat tree here. So it felt like a sign, I guess. And I wanted to grow citrus because it's very, very popular and easy to grow here in California. So that's where I started by putting a citrus orchard in. And then from there, it was just learning about, I guess, tree care and how interesting and fascinating all these different varieties are, how they grow, when they grow, how to prune them, how to plant and space them. Obviously, all the many, many, many different things you can do with the produce. I mean, just take an apple and there's like 14 different things you could do with that apple besides just eat it, right? So a lot of different opportunities. And I don't know, just getting into a different type of gardening, the perennial plant that gives you food over and over and over again, once you set it up you know, after a couple of years, which does sound like a long time, and it waiting is tough. But if you set it up correctly, I mean, right now, it's been three years since I put in the orchard, at least the first part of it, the citrus orchard, and it's pumping out citrus like crazy. And so finally, I'm starting to see the fruits literally of my labor. What do you got growing? Do you have a favorite? And what do you got growing these days? What's what's taken off? Oh, man. So let's go non citrus first. I've got a peach and nectarine an apple, two pomegranates, a papaya, and an apricot and a banana and grapes. And that's it. Oh my God. <laughs> and then for the citrus, I'm not going to get them all, but basically I have one lime, two lemons, I think four oranges, and then some of the weirder citrus, like you know your grapefruit, your yuzu, lemon, which is a Japanese variety, kumquats, those sorts of things. So I think I have about 14 different citrus in the front yard. That's amazing. Yeah. Do you have blood orange? Yeah, I have a variety called a Moro blood orange. It's really, really tasty. Yeah. That's my next citrus I'd like to bring home. I am such a citrus nerd that when I went to Italy for my second year wedding anniversary trip, I dragged my husband. In case you're ever in Italy, I'll send it to you. There's a botanical garden that only has citrus, all ancient Italian citrus in it. And it was so cool. Citrus could be its whole own thing, just with all the different varieties you can grow and the history of it. But anyway, I digress. I have an episode on that for anybody who wants to learn about it. This is another thing that people talk about with homesteading. Can you talk about what a food forest is? Because I know that's like a whole approach to gardening. I know we're not talking about gardening so much today, but what is the food forest approach to growing food? The food forest to me, I mean, frankly, I haven't explored that modality very much, but it's more of like a permaculture-esque type of approach where you're trying to say, well, I could have these shrubs, these lower plants, these taller plants, etc. all just be random landscaping plants that you might find at the nursery, or I could replace them all with productive edibles. 
and building a tapestry and a landscape that pays you off in food, right? But also looks cool and looks beautiful. I, at least that's that's my understanding of it. And so you could say that the way I'm approaching it is akin to a food forest, but it's I'm approaching it definitely more from like a, this is my orchard area, this is my garden area, this is my chicken area, instead of like it all being integrated into one sort of sweeping landscape. But I think there's many different approaches to it. The general philosophy is, let's say you wanted a, I don't know, you had a short fence on the north side of your property and you you wanted to block your neighbor's view, right? A lot of people might put in like an arborvitae hedge, uh, something nice and tall, right? And a food forest type mentality would say, what is a tall plant that I can block the hedge with that also produces for me, right? Instead of just picking a big bush that blocks a view. So it's kind of swapping out different ideas for something that pays you back. Yeah, I love that. So cool. And then obviously preserving food is the other side of homesteading. Do you have a favorite way of preserving food or the method of preserving food that kind of got you into, I'm assuming the epic food preservation situation that you have now? Not so epic yet. I mean, I'm, I'm still working on that skill set, but I would say the easiest one is, is a quick pickles. So any sort of refrigerator style pickle where you're not full canning, because once you get into canning, you really have to get into some of the food safety and proper techniques. But if you do like pickled red onions or pickled cucumbers or pickled whatever you want, really, you can do pickled carrots. There's a lot of ways to do it. It's just like a simple brine solution that you you boil and put in a jar and then seal that jar off. Really easy way to do it. Another easy way that requires nothing besides maybe something to tie your produce with would be hang drying. So hang drying your herbs. We hang dried a ton of peppers last year. So hundreds of peppers hanging in the rafters of the shed that I have. And actually just yesterday looked at them and they're like nice and dry and sort of crispy and ready to be ground up into a powder or rehydrated into a soup or or whatever. And that's just because I had hundreds and hundreds more peppers than I could use last summer, right? And so what a great way to do it and just took an afternoon of kind of stringing those up. So fun. And also that feels like it's probably such a meditative practice, just stringing hundreds of peppers on on a string or on a wire. Yeah, yeah. What's next for you? Do you have more projects or do you feel like you're just going to sit with what you've got for now? Yeah, I think there's more. I mean, I'd like to explore some different fruit trees and bushes. I've, I've had a hard time with like any of the raspberries and blueberries in my area. I just need to study up on that and get a little bit better at growing those. Getting into more of native landscapes. So, you know, everyone in a suburban area has that curb strip that's like right in front of your house. You don't own it, but you have to maintain it type of thing. And in my case, I'd much rather do that with natives because I don't have to do a whole lot to care for natives. They're, they're suited to the area. And so exploring that a little bit, which I haven't done a whole lot of, and then just basic aesthetic garden design and, and landscaping practices to kind of beautify the space more and make it feel less like a production farm garden than a beautiful home garden. Yeah, totally. So getting into a lot of that kind of thing. But the main systems, I would say, weird to say it, but are kind of in now at the property, which is cool. So cool. Well, your book, I mean, as a future homesteader, as a dreaming of my future homestead with chickens, your book was such a great, not even, in, I mean, introduction, but you really do talk about exactly how to do all of the minutiae of all of the kind of high level things we discussed today. So what is the book? This is like your third or your fourth book. Where can people get it? And also where can people find you and all of the amazing, I mean, your brand has certainly grown since the last time you were on the show. So let us know all the good things. Yeah, so the book's out and you can buy it on Amazon. It's called Epic Homesteading. You can buy it on Amazon, Barnes & Noble. You can buy copies from our store at shop.epicgardening.com. And then as far as where to find us, it's just Epic Gardening. I mean, if wherever you want to look, social, podcast, YouTube, et cetera, it's all Epic Gardening. We have multiple YouTube channels. We have a podcast called The Beat and everything else is, is called Epic Gardening. So you can connect with us there and you'll be able to find kind of the whole universe of stuff that we've created. Yeah. And it's been so cool to see how you're bringing in different creators. How many different creator contributors do you have now under the Epic Gardening brand? I think we're working with about four or five right now. And the goal is to find, I mean, the goal really of the company is teach the world to grow. So obviously I can't do that by myself. So finding passionate growers in different areas of expertise is the goal. So you'll start to see that coming out, like maybe someone who's really, really good at orchards. Because to be good at orchard care, you kind of have to be like 50. It's specific. 
you have to be old enough to have yeah. grown in those seasons <laughs> of trees. And I'm not there yet. So we'll see. But yeah, lots to come. So cool. Well, so proud of you, friend. And congratulations on your book release. Everything will be linked in the show notes. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kevin, for this interview. I've known him for so long. I'm so proud of him (laughs) for the insanity of his business that he's grown it to and how many people he's helping grow food successfully. His new book is called Epic Homesteading and it's available wherever books are sold. You can grab it. We'll include links to the book and all of his social channels. You should definitely follow him if you're interested in growing your own food. He has such amazing resources. I hope this episode inspired you and has given you so many inspirational ideas to maybe take steps towards with your growing season this year. And until next time, my sweet plant friends, keep growing joy. Plant friend, thank you for tuning in today. It means so much to me that I get to be part of your planty journey. If you like what you heard, make sure you're subscribed to the show so you never miss an episode. We have so many incredible interviews and solo episodes on incredible houseplant and gardening topics that you will not want to miss this year. And while you're over there in the podcast player subscribing, why don't you click over to the review section of Growing Joy with Plants and leave us a review. Reviews are tremendously helpful for the growth of the podcast, so thanks in advance. If you're looking for more opportunities to grow as a plant parent with Growing Joy content, we've got so many options for you. First, I highly recommend you taking the Plant Parent Personality Test. It's free. It's super fun. It takes three minutes to complete. At the end of the test, you're going to get your Plant Parent Personality Profile and a curated list of plants, projects, and podcast episodes that are right up your alley, tailored just for you and your lifestyle, inspired by your results. The links are in the show notes. If you're looking to uplevel your Plant Parent game, I have so many free downloads on my website that I think could help you, like the Understanding Natural Light download or nine different ways to green up your office space. If you'd like to support the show monetarily and help me bring the show to as many people as possible for free, you can head to our Patreon link in the show notes to learn more about our offerings. And finally, I invite you to come hang out with me and continue the planty conversation on social media, on Instagram and TikTok. I'm growing joy with Maria. My DMs are always open if you have requests for topics or ideas for the show. Thank you again for listening. It is truly my honor and delight to help you keep blooming and keep growing joy.